Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Double Down News Live. Before we get going tonight, it's important to note that this session and all of the work produced by Double Down News would not be possible without the incredible support support of our committed patrons. If you enjoy the show or the other content that is created by DDN, then please do visit the Patreon link in the description and join us today. As always, please subscribe to the YouTube channel, like this video to help us with the algorithms and share the video as well. Last week, we got together ahead of Dominic Cummings' testimony before Parliament to talk about what he might reveal, and Wednesday's session did not disappoint. But for all that Cummings positioned himself as an outsider, whether he truly wants to hold the government to account or try to absolve himself of responsibility remains to be seen. Tonight, we are joined by somebody who has spent a long time holding the government to account. In setting the in setting up the Good Law Project, tonight's guest, Jolian Morm, has dragged the government through the courts, kicking and screaming, I think it's fair to say. Joe, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Great pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Lynn. No problem at all. I mean, you've you've spent sort of a, a long time holding the government to account, but we're going to talk tonight, I think, at, particularly at the beginning anyway, about the, the last year, the last 18 months. And I, I want to start really with a focus on uh, the dodgy contract, shall we say. I mean, we've had um, 18 months of frontline workers saving lives without adequate PPE, and we've seen contracts going to a pest control company, uh, a jeweler in Florida, I believe, uh, a confectioner somewhere else. Um, and this week, we've seen uh, an expose, if you like, revealed by the Good Law Project. Uh, and it's another staggering one. And without me giving the work here, I kind of want to pass over to you to allow you to give our viewers a bit of a rundown about this involving uh, Pretty Patel, Manira Mirza, and a bunch of middlemen, and I think it's fair to say a very, very lucrative contract. It's difficult to know where to start really with this story um, because there is just so much of it. You know, we had leaks from four different sources, um, all in relation to the same contractual framework. Um, and so we were able to look at it through lots and lots of different lenses and, you know, whichever set of lens you looked at it through, it was really, really extraordinary. Um, and I spent a long time trying to sort of write it up and I didn't really nail it. So what I ended up doing was sort of writing a here is everything type piece and here are all the documents. So you journalists can go away and, and write whatever story you you want to write. Um, and as it turned out, it was all, even though we had all the documents, all of which we published, it was just too hot for pretty much everybody. Anyway, I did that. And then I worked out what the line actually was. I worked it out very late um, because the sort of key bit of um, information came in quite late on Friday afternoon. We published it a week ago tomorrow. Um, and the key bit of information um, in context was this, that um, this company, Pharmaceuticals Direct Limited, which had a history of um, supplying um, PPE um, and pharmaceutical products, and actually had some in stock. So in many ways, was a much better company than um, others that won contracts, had been approached by um, a middleman who had said, um, I can help you win government contracts and you'll need to pay me but you only need to pay me if I deliver but if I deliver you'll need to pay me very well and he was asked for proof as um, uh, I understand it from my source anyway that he could deliver and he gave a, a number 10 email address and and almost all of that information only came in on Friday um, and it was only as I was walking home from from uh, from the shops on Saturday afternoon, it sort of clicked with me that actually that set of facts alone is enough to show you that the process was crooked. Um, no clean process would 
need politically connected middlemen in order to deliver contracts to those who ought to have them. You only have political connected middlemen working on a sort of no win, no fee basis for substantial sums of money. You only have suppliers engaging those people if everybody understands that fundamentally this is about doing political favours for people. Um, and that um, is the story really that we've all felt, I think, through the pandemic has been the reality, and we now have pretty good evidence of it. If I sort of drop down from that broad picture to some of the detail, um, so you have these two guys, um, Serb Shergill, Serb Shergill, and Samir Jassal. Jassal, very well connected um, in the Conservative Party, so there are photos floating around of him shaking hands with each of the last three Conservative Prime Ministers. He's a uh, Tory councillor. He's given some money to the Conservative Party. And Serbjit Shergill, who is um, a bit of a mystery, really, um, he says he's a pharmaceutical consultant, but there's no evidence of that that we've been able to find. And indeed, the Daily Mail um, have described him as a bricklayer. I think it's possibly a little unfair, but, um, you know, th th there's no suggestion really that he... Um, has anything to bring to the party other than political connections. And so the story begins with um, Jassal um, emailing with Munira Mirza, who's the sort of um, prime minister's principal political advisor, um, often sort of thought of as the principal architect of the culture wars, um, and she offers to help him. And um, a couple of hours, I think, later, he gets an email from uh, somebody saying, I understand your organisation can supply PPE. Well, that's pretty odd because he doesn't have an organisation. I mean, even he doesn't um, pretend to have an organisation. And um, obviously the civil servant who's writing that email finds it pretty odd as well. Why am I writing to this guy? Uh, why am I having to describe his organization? Um, why am I asking him to pitch PPE contracts to us? And he replies and he says, ah, well, um, actually the people who can supply you with PPE are Pharmaceuticals Direct Limited. Anyway, um, so you, you, what you then have is a process, I mean, within a few days, um, PDL is offered a, an enormous um, contract, um, all of which falls away because there's a decision taken centrally not to supply the sort of, uh, for government not to source the key um, product that PDL is then supplying. But it's very, very quickly replaced because um, Pretty Patel gets involved. So Munira Mirza, not someone who has any brief around supplying, procuring PPE for um, frontline healthcare workers in the pandemic is involved, and then Pretty Patel comes becomes involved. Um, she's not, as far as we can see, the MP for any of the parties. Um, she's Home Secretary. She's not really procuring PPE either. Um, and she sends off these rather peremptory emails um, to Michael Gove and to everyone else, um, demanding that PDL get these um, contracts to, to, to procure PPE. And then um, very, very shortly after that, the very um, type of PPE that PDL is offering to supply, um, PDL gets a contract to deliver. Um, but it then gets even worse. That, that contract sort of for 30 million quid and it's, um, I don't know, it's a bit, it's sort of 20% above the baseline price, something like that, the government's paying to everyone else. But um, a, a couple of months later, PDL wins another contract for £103 million. And this one's absolutely extraordinary because you have civil servants complaining that the price that PDL um, is getting paid for this stuff is double the price that government's paying everyone else. You have um, 
cabinet office insisting that the deal must go through, you have civil servants briefing the accounting officer and the accounting officer is the um, person who has to ultimately sign off on the contract, briefing the accounting officer that they absolutely must have um, this particular type of face mask because we're on the point of running out. But um, from another one of our leakers, we know that only four days previously, uh, a different supplier of exactly the same face mask and exactly the same quantity, another good quality supplier, so far as we can see, was told by a civil servant, we don't need any of those face masks, we have enough. So he's being told we don't need any. Um, and civil servants in cabinet office are pushing really hard for PDL to win this £103 million contract um, at almost double the price that we're paying to everyone else. So it, it's very, very odd indeed. And indeed, it sort of tells a kind of meta story of the pandemic um, uh, looked at through my eyes, which is you have um, suppliers, would-be suppliers, who are putting deals together. They're contacting um, their sources in factories, typically in China. They're getting promises of PPP supply to government. Um, they're pitching it to civil servants. Civil servants are saying, yes, they're sending them contracts for the supplier to sign. But then government isn't signing and they're drumming their fingers and drumming their fingers and drumming their fingers. And then um, they're told, <clears throat> they're told, actually, we don't need this anymore. And their perception, and I must have heard this story six, eight, ten times, is that that contract has gone to someone else. And of course, that's exactly what happened in the PDL contract. It looks as though the contract, the PDL one, was... Um, in effect, stolen from somebody else and handed to PDL. PDL has, as we know, these political connections. I've already mentioned Manira Mirza. I've mentioned um, Priti Patel, and there's another cabinet minister um, involved as well, and we'll release his name very, very shortly. And what we can also see is that um, this guy, Cedric Shergill, invoices PDL something north of 16 million pounds plus VAT, um, some of which is um, explicitly for services in connection with um, face masks. Um, and I just don't understand how in a clean process sums like that needs to be paid by people who aren't supplying PPE. You know, it, in a way, it's exactly the same as the, the Sega story. You had um, this Floridian jeweler who won something like 350 million pounds of PPE contracts. And he agreed to pay to this Spanish businessman for doing um, very little. He agreed to pay, um, I think, north of $50 million. Um, how does that um, intermediary, that Spanish intermediary, win those con? Uh, win those sums of money if this is a clean process. I mean, you just have to, <laughs> you know, if your nose and your toes are facing in the same direction, you know that this is really, really, really bad. And we are um, very likely to put this fact pattern in the hands of the criminal authorities very shortly. Yeah, I would, that's something I wanted to come straight back to you on, Joe, because, I mean, you, you've answered um, my first question and more there with that really, really comprehensive overview of the of the situation. I mean, the, the there are two questions that spring to mind immediately that, that I can see some people asking in the comments as well. And the main one is in a country with with no written constitution that kind of determines what ministers can can do or cannot do. Um, where the Prime Minister is able to bypass Parliament um, with royal prerogative, although sometimes not, as you know very well yourself. Um, we, we have an electoral system that kind of wildly um, 
you know, disenfranchises millions of people uh, in general elections. We have a, a House of Lords that uh, has people sat there based on what uh, long lost relatives did <laughs> a long, long time ago. I mean, what the hell are we supposed to do about this? I mean, obviously yourself and the Good Law Project are doing incredible work that a lot of people are supporting, but people are screaming when they see things like this. I mean, the fact that, as you raised there, a, a contract. Um, you know, worth was it 130 million or so, or 100 million or so, um, overvalued by nearly 50 million pounds. I mean, what what are we supposed to do about this? Well, I mean, there are legal remedies, but the um, sanction um, that I think people want is um, the sanction of criminal punishment. And it's very, very difficult for an organization like Good Law Projects that doesn't have the power to compel the production of evidence um, to bring, uh, oh, that's a little, is it going to restart? <laughs> Let me, that would be very bad. That would be very bad, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good with me. Um, very unamusing for you, Liam, in particular. Indeed. Um, it's very, very difficult for Good Law Project to bring criminal prosecutions because we don't have the advantage that the police have of being able to compel people to produce evidence to us. Um, and what we can do is bring these fact patterns to light and we can attach political cost um, to people breaking the law um, and we can hope to get enough information together to cause the criminal authorities themselves to take a look. But, um, I mean, many of those watching will be thinking to themselves, but, you know, will the police take a look? Um, can we rely on the criminal law authorities to investigate this government? And, you know, I share that question, actually. Um, there's a sort of an internal audit function in government that the NAO reported um, only last week, uh, as finding that there was a very high risk, high risk, or very high risk, I forget exactly how they put it, of fraud in PP procurement. And we have no reason to think that the criminal authorities took that seriously. I mean, I think in England at the moment, um, if you're the sort of person who speaks truth to power, who does their job fearlessly, you just don't last in post. Um, you either resign or you're or you're sacked or you're you know bullied out. Speaking of um, Pretty Patel, um, and so those who hold these posts that are um, the sorts of posts that need to consent to the beginning of a criminal investigation into a government minister are, as a generality, not the sort of person um, who is going to authorise behaviour like that. So. Um, it is, you know, it's undoubtedly um, a pretty dismal and a very difficult picture. I mean, the question you actually asked me was, well, what do we, what do we do about that? Um, and that's something I think about a lot, actually, because, uh, I mean, I found, I mean, I'm quite engaged by the sort of state of the country, obviously. Um, and... I think it would be really, really bad for my mental health where I'm not actually able to do anything about it. But because I feel like I have some ability to influence, um, I don't despair. Uh, indeed, I feel energized by the possibility of fighting back. And that energy then drives me to do more and the more um, I hope at least, has sort of positive effects for society. And one of the questions that Good Law Project's asking itself, I'm asking as the sort of director of Good Law Project is, well, how do we create that dynamic for other people? Um, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to bring um, further despair, but I, I don't, I think it's more likely than not that we'll never have another Labour government. I think the the playing field is tilted too much towards the Tories and is continuing to be tilted more and more. 
And in that environment, it becomes quite difficult to sort of motivate yourself to, uh, you know, to do normal political canvassing. And um, none of us feel particularly inspired by uh, the Labour Party. Uh, Keir Starmer doesn't really seem to understand that actually politics today is all about how you make people feel. He doesn't have the ability to make people feel anything. And I think that's one of the reasons why Labour is languishing the polls. But, you know, in, in, in the midst of all of that rather depressing stuff, um, what I'm trying to do is think about how the process that's been very productive for me personally, very good for my mental health personally, um, and also, I hope has delivered some some good things for um, those in my local community, but also, you know, those in the country at large. How how others might um, encounter that um, sort of virtuous circle? How we might create structures uh, that enable other people to respond in ways that are good for their mental health in ways that energize their desire for a better world and um, which because they are energized deliver that better world i mean that's one of the one of the sort of questions i spend most of my time thinking about and trying to work out how we might deliver on yeah and on that point about building a, a better world it gives me the chance to to make sure to ask all of our viewers to make sure they join double down news on patreon and also to follow the links in the description to also support the work of the good law project and on a on a more serious point it allows me to reflect back actually joe to um some of the work that you did back in February, where there was a major victory for the Good Law Project in uh, defeating uh, the government in court. I wondered if you might reflect for viewers, many I'm sure who supported um, the, the efforts uh, against Matt, Matt Hancock at the time, uh, just on what, what that was like, really. I mean, both the case itself, but perhaps more actually the aftermath um, of, of sort of defeating uh, the government in the court and the Secretary of State himself? I think everyone was um, quite surprised at the um, level of interest there was in the result. Um, I certainly was. Lawyers couldn't believe it um, because lawyers didn't see it as being legally significant. Um, but I guess it felt like reason for cheer, which has not been easy to come by um, for, um, for the left. Uh, it was a real bloody nose. I remember watching Sophie Ridge asking um, Matt Hancock whether he would resign. Uh, and then I remember watching Sophie Ridge asking Keir Starmer whether he wanted Matt Hancock to resign and Keir Starmer saying no. Which was a slightly took the wind out of my sails a bit. Um, and then, you know, uh, Andrew Marr uh, also gave Matt Hancock a, a proper kicking. Um, we're waiting also for the result of the public first case uh, about the awarding of contracts to um, friends of Michael Gove and Dominic Cummings. Um, and we've got absolutely extraordinary material. I can't tell you about it, unfortunately, because it would be in contempt of court, uh, in another case that we're bringing uh, about the award of contracts to Hanbury, which is a, a sort of strongly vote leave um, Tory party associated um, sort of market research firm, really. Um, I mean, uh, government wrote a very grumpy letter to us uh, a couple of days ago. Um, not, uh, I have to tell you, the first such grumpy letter we've received. And I think they said that there were something like 26 cases that we have lined up uh, against government have brought or have lined up against government. 
And um, that number feels about right. We have a long, long string of litigation against government. And, you know, some of those cases we will lose and some of those cases we will win. And Good Law Project will survive if we drop early enough enough of the weaker cases and pursue with um, uh, full vigour and attention um, the cases where the fact patterns are stronger. Um, but, you know, we're, we've got lots and lots more in gestation. So today, many of us will have read about uh, the peerage for Crudas ignoring the um, advice uh, given by the independent commission into whether you ought to get a peerage, uh, that Crudas shouldn't get a peerage, uh, followed, I think, three days after he took his seat in the House of Lords by him giving half a million quid to the Conservative Party. And, you know, we're looking at um, we're already looking at that uh, to see whether or not we think that's um, unlawful. Um, you know, we're doing lots and lots of work in the sort of um, sphere of, as we put it, trying to protect governance and democracy. Um, but also very, very important to everyone at the Good Law Project is the work that we're doing around um, protecting communities that are um, being victimised in the culture wars. I, I just sort of noticed as I walked in that just sort of behind me is the rainbow flag that my my um, uh, wife uh, has behind her desk. I'm sitting at her desk at the moment. Um, we're doing a lot of work um, with the uh, trans community, which is being made um, a real victim of the um, government's culture wars. I mean, uh, every week, I think I speak to um, someone in that community who is um, suicidal. I went to see the trans family of uh, a trans woman who um, committed suicide on Sunday. I feel... Um, uh, deeply upset, actually, and, and really, really angry uh, about the victimization of that um, vulnerable community. Um, we're doing work with people like Patrick Vernon, who's a Windrush campaigner. We're doing work around protecting children in care. I'm working with um, an NEU union official, Daniel Kabidi, to um, try and bring justice to a... Um, Romani family whose um, son committed suicide after um, years of racial harassment. Um, you know, all of these, all of these groups being uh, targeted by, uh, by by Murdoch quite quite vigorously at the moment. Um, we're 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 looking at well, we've actually issued proceedings. We haven't yet um, talked about what those proceedings are. Um, around the neglect of children in care homes. We're um, very, very ambitious. We really, really want to use the voice that this um, work around SLEES has given us to advocate for communities who are shut out of advocating for themselves. I mean, that to me is what being a good ally looks like. There is no point us gathering social capital. Um, the world is not made better by me being more famous or Good Law Project being wealthier um, or me being um, broadly liked. Um, I don't aspire to any of those things. Um, the world is made better by us um, winning social capital through some parts of our work uh, and spending it um, where we can make a difference. I think that that's the stuff um, that feels to me really profoundly important. 
Yeah, I, I think the advocacy work um, that you've been doing and the, the platform that you've been giving as well to different campaign groups has been really important. And I, I think it's been reflected uh, mm -hmm. online how much that has been appreciated. I'm, I'm sure the, the real world uh, effect of that is being felt as well. And it is something we'll return to later on as well is the, the wider work, um, particularly on the environment as well, that we've had lots of questions submitted on it as well. I know people are interested in that. But just to kind of round off, I think, on the PPE subject, a question that we were we were asked uh, that people submitted quite a lot, um, and it kind of will, will sum up this part of the interview, I guess, really, um, was not so much about the criminal charges, but was about whether it's possible to get some of the money back, um, whether it will be possible at some point uh, for the the way that taxpayers' money has been used um, throughout the crisis with these the sort of PPE scandals, uh, whether it will ever be possible to see any of that again, or whether you think the government will get away with it uh, in the end. And, you know, all of these sort of figures that have managed to uh, swindle millions, if you like, will will simply sail away with that. Um, I mean, having been um, impolite about uh, Keir Starmer, um, I have worked with Rachel Reeves' team, certainly when she was um, Michael Gove's shadow, uh, and they developed, with a little bit of input from us, some ideas about chasing up that money. The, the problem, really, is that neither government nor... Um, it's, um, I think, sometimes rather dodgy suppliers are interested in having those fights because um, the supplier misses out financially and government is acutely politically embarrassed. Um, I mean, there's a very good way of making that point, actually. Uh, so there's a a family in Newmarket, I forget the names, uh, with whom Matt Hancock's been photographed, very well connected, sort of um, Tory racing set in Newmarket. And um, no obvious ability to supply PP, but they won you know, a PP contract. I think the number was 15 million or thereabouts. Uh, and they were given a contract and they couldn't deliver. Um, so government just agreed to cancel the contract. Um, so uh, we hear. But um, that's not how it works in the real world. In the real world, if you undertake to deliver a product and you can't deliver the product, you get sued. Um, you don't get to just walk away. You don't get a sort of um, uh, a bet where if you can supply the PPE, you make a fortune. If you can't supply the PPE, you get to walk away without any any liability. That's just not um, how it's supposed to happen. I mean, I was more, more, more alarmed, was I, by the revelation that they'd been able to cancel the contract without penalty than I was by, you know, yet another example of fairly... Um, to me, um, obscene cronyism. You know, <laughs> you do sometimes wonder whether there's anyone in Matt Hancock's social circle or family circle who hasn't won a PP contract. You've got to be thinking to yourself, did I, did I offend him at Christmas or something like that? What did I say that's pissed him off that I, I alone have not won a PPE contract? Indeed. And on that point, I mean, just a very quick one off the back of a lot of the PPE work you've been doing. I mean, have any of them ever reached out to you? Have any of them tried to speak to you or the Good Law Project, any of the ministers? Or I mean, I'm not expecting you to name names, or, or maybe I am, but <laughs> it would it'd be interesting to see if any of them have tried to make contact. Well, I mean, I've worked with some Tory MPs, some of them high-profile backbenchers. Uh, David Davies is in Good Law Project's annual report. He's a former chair of the Public Accounts Committee, so he understands um, this stuff. But he's far from the only one. And I do speak to a couple of Tory ministers, including a cabinet minister, um, 
you know, I, I WhatsApp them and they they reply. Um, as to the companies, well, I mean, I've had defamation threats um, from Pestfix and Iander. Uh, neither of them have sued me yet. Um, and, um, I mean, it's always surprised me that they haven't sought to work with us. I have certainly intimated to one very high profile um, supplier uh, that rather than going after them, I'd rather that they helped me um, go after government. You know, um, it's not particularly attractive, but it's sort of inherent in the logic of capitalism, isn't it? That if government is handing out free money um, to businesses um, and you're in business, you kind of join the queue. And it's a bit um, unworldly to criticise you for, for doing that. You criticise government for handing out free money and, and certainly... If you look at the VIP loan, handing out free money rather selectively. Um, and, you know, there is one company that we're in discussions with at the moment. That company is very, very keen that we drop um, some of our legal arguments. And they are telling us that they will give us information to help us nail government if we drop those arguments. Uh, and what we're trying to do is assess whether we think that those who have funded that litigation would be pleased or displeased by the bargain that's on the table. And fundamentally, that involves us understanding, you know, um, quite how smoking is their gun. And at the moment, I, I don't yet know. But certainly, I would have thought, you know, if there are any, um, any businesses whose uh, contracts, good law project is challenging, who are listening as they ought to be to you, Liam, and Double Down News, um, I'd encourage them to have a sort of without prejudice discussion with us. There may be more common ground uh, than they might expect. Our interest is in the abuse of public power, the misuse of public money. It's not um, on this stage at any rate in the um, failings of capitalism. And you've uh, teed me up nicely there to say that if you are watching, make sure you subscribe uh, to the YouTube channel, uh, like and share the video. And of course, join the patron as well, which is there on screen. And also we've got the link to join and support Double Down. Uh, sorry, not Double Down. You can do that as well. But also the Good Law Project link is there in the description as well. Um, I want to move on, on some from some of the PPE specifics um joe to talk a little bit more i guess about some of the politics that you discussed earlier and um, a little bit about the media and then just to to round off really with some of the wider work that you're doing and your your plans for the future one of the famous questions that's asked in the media at the moment um of just about every politician or commentator if there's ever a scandal story about boris johnson is whether the public cares about this you know oh, the, whether it's a ppe um, scandal or it's the wallpaper or it's his wedding or whatever the question is oh well it, it doesn't really matter because the the opposition don't want to make a big deal of it and um people just don't seem to care because he's flying high in the polls and incredibly popular because of um the vaccine rollout if that is the case, how do you think we do make people care? And I, I guess, secondly, I mean, the, the support that you have received through the Good Law Project, does, does that not perhaps suggest that, that people do care? Um, and, the, you know, perhaps that question that the media keep asking of people is actually pretty redundant. Um, I mean, the truth is that there is no counterfactual. We don't know what the opinion polls would be showing um, if Good Law Project wasn't bringing these actions exposing um, corruption or, um, at the very least, sleaze in government, so we just we don't we don't know um, what the answer is to to that question. Um, I mean, I think 
uh, Johnson is, um, I mean, he's a great populist. He's the politician um, of the the moment. He understands in ways that um, mere lawyers do not how to speak to people, um, how to cause them to feel that they're uh, that he's on their side. Um, you know, I'm not a political theorist, um, a political scientist. Uh, there are better people than me to talk about this stuff. But my own instinct um, is that uh, you need to cause people to, 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 to feel something. I also think that um, the corruption stuff, the sleaze stuff, uh, won't matter um, until it does, and then when it does, and I think it will, um, it will matter profoundly and it will matter to everyone. I mean, the evidence that I have is actually that people do care about it. I don't think you can draw too many conclusions from the fact that, you know, 30 odd thousand people give us money every month. Um, that's uh, a very significant number, but it's not electorally significant. But um, I do think you can draw some conclusions from the really vigorous responses we're getting from government now, really quite serious sort of personal attacks, threats um, directed at, 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 at me. Um, uh, when I speak to journalists on the right of the political spectrum, they tell me that number 10 really, really hates this stuff. When we speak to those in cabinet office, um, sometimes, not always, sometimes through intermediaries, um, we hear that um, they are really, really troubled by it. Um, but of course, um, you know, your point about Johnson being so far ahead in the opinion polls is, um, is, 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 is plainly true. Um, we just can't know. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you a question then about the, the media in general. I think that Good Law Project um, seems very successful, really, with the media. I mean, a, lo a lot of the stories land really well uh, across the, the press, really. I mean, obviously, um, we read uh, quite a lot of, of the the stories in, in The Guardian and perhaps some of the places you would expect to see uh, stories about Johnson and so on. But obviously, as you said, uh, the Mail have done some reporting on this uh, and other out outlets as well. And do you think they take it quite seriously, the work that you're doing? What, why do you think it is that papers that have traditionally been seen to be quite close to Johnson or supportive of him are, are quite happy to cover the work? Um, so, I mean, you know, even in The Telegraph and The Sun, we've had pretty good coverage and in The Sun, um, you know, we've had requests for more. So, you know, Good Law Project's in a very fortunate situation of um, developing lots and lots of great stories and then getting to choose which newspapers to, to give them to. And, you know, we can be pretty much guaranteed that whoever we go to with um, most of our stories, they'll, they'll be very, very keen to carry them. Um, I mean, we'd, I like working with the mail, um, I guess, for two reasons. One is, three reasons, really. One is that, that actually what um, we, can, we can change the minds of uh, mail readers. Um, we can't change the minds of Guardian readers because um, they're already on side. Um, another is that the mail sets the agenda in ways that other um, newspapers don't. But I think the reason, most of all, that I like working with the mail, uh, despite the fact that its politics are very much not mine, is that usually when the mail goes for a story, they really go for a story. They go for a story really, really hard and they make it count. Um, I mean, I was quite frustrated actually with the way in which the mail covered the story that I started off um, talking about um, earlier this evening, 
uh, and I had words with their editorial team. And I said, look, I'm not going to give you the, the the story about the other cabinet minister because I think you sort of, you backed it up, you pulled your punches. And unless you're going to go hard at a story, there's not really much work, um, not much point in me working with Mel because um, I don't really like um, much of your, your politics. Um, but if I then sort of ask, if I sort of cast my eyes a bit wider i mean the ft i think is a is a great newspaper um but it's not really populist um the bbc you know you get enormous enormous audiences um for content on the bbc um but on sort of stories of high politics um you know they are very very Careful would be the polite way of putting it. The less polite way of putting it would be that they do pull their punches. Um, and I really don't like that. Um, and so, you know, one of the things we really want to do, actually, much like Double Down News, is we want to develop uh, a much bigger audience of our own. So our mailing list at the moment is... It's a bit over 200,000. I hope it'll be half a million by the end of the year. We're sort of starting to target mailing list growth. Um, and that way, um, we have a stronger, an even stronger negotiating hand with newspapers and broadcast media because the bigger our audience, the less um, we, we need them. And uh, so the harder we can negotiate with them about exactly um, what they'll cover. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I think the stuff you have to think about is quite, is quite transactional. You have to be quite strategic about it. Um, it just, much though I love, um, The Guardian, I just, you know, there is just not that much point in us getting stories in The Guardian. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I was going to ask was you, you're doing some quite serious investigative journalism of your own at the Good Law Project. I know that you, you have people working there on investigative journalism um, specifically. I mean, how important is that for you? Is that something that you see as very important, you know, as the project doing itself? Um, it's not uh, that I desperately want us to be doing it ourselves it's more about us being able to manage um news flow so if you're working with the mail on a story um you know it might take one week it might take two weeks it might take three weeks for them to get the story out and that doesn't always work um, with other stuff that we've got going on. There's also just quite a high cadence of stories. So, you know, we could put out a story every day. Every day uh, we could put out a story that would get into a national newspaper. We have such rich content. Um, and it's just sort of impossible to keep that many balls in the air um, unless you can control the cadence of news flow. So um, what we try for is a, a mix of some stories that we have got a sort of slightly more relaxed timeline on and we'll typically give those to papers and then there's stuff that will be, that has to come out, you know, at a particular moment. And then we'll go to whoever we know will like the story and say, look, if you want it, you can have it, but it's going to be, you know, day after tomorrow. And we'll give them as much notice as we can, but we will say to them, look, either you cover it then um, or uh, you tell us you can't, um, in which case we'll give it to someone else, or you don't tell us you can't, in which case and we won't come to you again because it's very, very frustrating, as it were, only to find out after the event that, um, a story that we thought was going to be properly covered hasn't been properly covered. Um, but we've got a very, very, very talented um, head of media. Um, and um, she's um, she's uh, fairly um, new to us. And um, she's not uh, hugely 
experienced yet, but she's extremely good and she's getting our stories everywhere. And we basically had four of, of, of her <laughs> and that'll be fun. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks for that, Joe. I mean, to move on from uh, the media to, to politics, we're really going through all of the, the subjects um, not to discuss around a, a dinner table, I guess. Um, I, I think it's quite interesting, really. We we finally agree on a Labour leader, I think. Um, our assessment, I think, of Keir Starmer is, is, is quite similar. I mean, obviously, you and I disagreed quite eminently over the period of time of, of Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. I think to varying degrees, it's fair to say, we kind of um clashed at different times at different levels about Jeremy's leadership. And um, but I mean kind of looking back on that the, of Jeremy's time as leader but now with with Starmer I think one of the things that the that said about the good law project is that you're you're kind of framed as like the the real opposition if you like to to Boris Johnson. It's something that I see as quite a common refrain on on social media at least anyway from people saying that um you know you're kind of providing or have been providing the opposition throughout this pandemic that just hasn't been there from the Labour Party. Uh, obviously, that was a, a common attack used against uh, Jeremy Corbyn, was that there was a, a lack of opposition. I mean, how how do you kind of see those sort of claims that, you know, you are acting as the official opposition within the sort of political context of, of the Labour leadership, if you like? Um, a, a sensible... QC um, always recognises um, a propensity towards self-aggrandisement and <laughs> flees from that possibility. Um, I mean, I read that stuff as well. I think it is quite difficult for Labour to land blows at the moment, and I've already indicated um, I mean, we both agree really as to one of the two reasons why that is so. Um, Starmer is struggling to move from being um, a lawyer and a decent man to becoming an effective politician. Um, but the other reason can't really be laid at Starmer's door, which is that the Conservative Party has emasculated um, Parliament. Parliament feels irrelevant um, to many of us. Um, I think because it is irrelevant to many of us, not just because of an 80 seat majority, but because of a whole host of other um, developments in the political landscape brought in under cover of the pandemic. Um, we now have um, quite close to sort of autocratic power resting in the hands of uh, Boris Johnson. Um, you know, the thing that really um, shocks me actually is, um, you know, once upon a time, I mean, as recently as um, 2000 and the 2010 um, parliament, we had sort of opposition day debates, and I think, is it twice every term, the opposition would get to nominate a subject for debate. And um, it would be a debate that you would choose with the desire of embarrassing the government on something um, they should be embarrassed on. Uh, every government screws stuff up. Um, and government recognising that this was a really important type of accountability would turn up to those opposition day debates and they'd um, win uh, the vote because uh, they had a majority in parliament, which is why they were the government. Um, but they would accept that that was a really important part of parliamentary democracy, of accountability through parliament. And now, um, very often, government just doesn't turn up. So Labour um, notionally sits in, a, in an empty chamber um, arguing with nobody because government has contempt for the parliamentary process. And it's very, very difficult um, for the Labour Party to be heard. I, I think, um, I mean, I sort of 
I, I, I'm not, I'm, I want to be very clear, I'm not making a comparison between the Labour Party and Good Law Project. But um, I also feel as though the Labour Party to me feels kind of irrelevant. I imagine it feels irrelevant to a lot of people watching this evening. And I imagine it feels irrelevant to the media as well. And um, that's a really, really dangerous state of affairs. Um, and if we benefit from it, well, that's nice for us, but it's bad for for society. It's bad for um, democracy. It, it, it doesn't deliver healthy governance. It's not a state of affairs that any of us should share. Yeah, thanks, Joe. And um, just before we come on to the, the final points, I just want to give uh, one last quick reminder to everybody uh, if you're not already do uh, become a patron to double down news the link there is on screen and also in the description you'll also find the link there to become a supporter of the good law project as well and if you're still watching on with us subscribe to the youtube channel like and share the video as well so joe i want to finish really by just talking about what what's in store for the good law project um as we go on obviously the work that you're doing is it's not just about ppe and it hasn't just been about the ppe scandals throughout the the pandemic you took action against the government on a level results um last year uh, you you do a lot of work on the the theme of no one left behind uh, I, I saw a uh, somebody asked whether you were thinking about taking any action about the the catch-up fund uh, scandal that took place um, just yesterday. Um, and also a lot of work that you do on the environment as well, the, the clean air case and also stopping fossil fuel construction. Uh, there's a lot there. I'm not expecting you to cover all of it, but if you could just sort of explain, uh, you did earlier, to be fair, touch on a lot of the work that you do in other areas. But what what are you what have you sort of got planned in the in the next 12 months? Well, um, I guess there are sort of two main initiatives. One is thinking about, and I've already talked about this, so I won't um, do more than mention it again. One is trying to think about whether the law can create, can replicate um, bottom-up uh, organisations can create legal structures that enable sort of um, grassroots organizations to flourish uh, in a way that activates um, our desire for a better world uh, around us. Um, there is no other way to respond positively to uh, a country that to me feels like one where democracy may have uh, have ended um you need to build from the ground up you need to build um communities you need to give people a way to stave off um despair and in the saving of staving off of despair they 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 do good as well so we're working um on that we're working towards those objectives um the other strand of work really is uh, around building um, other communities of interest around us. So Google Project is putting um, some money into developing a website offering um, practical legal advice to the trans community. We're treating it as a pilot. Um, for ways in which we might work with other communities. So we had a very close relationship with um, Reclaim These Streets formed in the aftermath of the killing of Sarah Everard. Um, but we speak to lots of um, groups um, on the progressive um, side of the political spectrum. Um, and I guess, I'm interested in understanding whether um, we might support their work uh, and they might strengthen us looking at it um, transactionally. I mean, there is a great prize, isn't there, 
if you can get all of the progressive communities that um, are so good at fighting with one another facing in the same direction. Um, and I wonder whether Good Law Project might be able to play a part in in doing that. Um, all of those um, communities that I talked about earlier, and no doubt others as well, um, are ones that I um, feel very acutely that we can help, and I feel um, desperately driven to to, to help. Um, but ultimately, if Good Law Project becomes bigger, um, there is more that we can do to help, not just in terms of resources, but because we will speak with a, a bigger voice, we'll carry a bigger political stick. Um, and, um, you know, these are really thorny problems and we're working, fortunately, we're working with really um, thoughtful, big political brains um, to help us figure out um, whether it's possible to do. And we'll, you know, we'll, we'll trial it um, in a couple of different ways. But, but, but that, that's what occupies um, me anyway as sort of director of the Good Law Project. Thanks, Joe. And um, I want to say a huge thank you to you for joining us uh, tonight. We've kept you for, for over an hour now, uh, but we really appreciate you taking all of those uh, questions. A lot of um, them there were sort of uh, scripted based off what our patrons had, had submitted in advance of the session. But a huge thank you uh, for your time, Joe. A great pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. Great no fun. problem at all. And uh, just a massive uh, thank you to everybody who has tuned in uh, to watch tonight. It's been a, another fantastic session. Uh, if you are not already a patron, uh, then please do join us at Double Down News. You'll find the link in the description. Uh, as you've heard from Joe tonight, please do also support the work of the Good Law Project. You will find the link to join them and support them in the description as well we'll be back next week for another episode of double down news as always uh take care and keep safe thank you everyone